Hello everyone, absolutely delighted to see so many of you with us this afternoon. Welcome to the Festival of Discovery and to our session on what's happening to the weather. Very pleased that you can join us for this session. Um, before we kick off, just a couple of housekeeping bits from me and then we'll get into the exciting stuff. So you've probably been very familiar with this by now. I'm sure we're all very familiar with Zoom by this point. Um, but to make sure the session runs smoothly, there are a couple of things we'd like you to, to do for us. The first thing is if you could please keep yourself on mute and that just makes sure that everyone can hear everything that's going on during the session. We do have captions or subtitles. So if you want to use those, you can go down to the bottom of the screen and just click CC or closed captions and those will pop up for you. If you'd like to rename yourself because your name will be visible, if you'd like to change that at all, you can click on participants find yourself and then just right click, say rename, and that'll allow you to change your name and how you appear. Um, and we say that because we are recording these sessions. So we um, hope that we can share these with people who aren't able to join us today. Um, so if you would like to not appear in the recording, that's not a problem at all. Just make sure that you switch your video off um, and stay on mute if you don't want to feature in any of the photos or recording that we might take during the session. If you do have any technical problems, uh, my lovely colleagues, Katie and Lindsay are here today. Uh, if you could just give us a wee wave. And if you have any tech concerns or if you have any other concerns, you can just privately message Katie using the chat function and she will be there to help you. And we will have time for some questions at the end of the session. So if you have some questions for our lovely panel, I hope you do, I do. Um, and please just put the word question uh, in front of um, your question in the chat box and that helps us just to find it nice and easily. Uh, we'd recommend watching this in speaker view so if you just go to the top right of your screen just click speaker view and that will make sure that you can see um, whoever's speaking at the time and not uh, 25 tiny faces. But that's it. That's the housekeeping. Let's kick off. Um, again, I'm absolutely delighted that you can join us this afternoon um, for a session on our national obsession, the weather. Um, it's certainly my personal obsession. Um, I'm based in Scotland and I spend far more time talking about the weather than I would care to admit. And I think it's something that as a country, as a society, we already talk about the weather a lot. And now we're having more and more discussions about climate change and what that's going to mean for us. And because of that, I think it's something that's becoming more and more on our minds and something we're talking about more and more. So this session, we're going to be unpacking a little bit about why we are so obsessed with the weather in this country and looking at how it might change over the coming years as a result of the climate crisis. So I am your host for this session. My name is Sophie Bridger. Um, I work for Eden Project Communities in Scotland. And I'd like to introduce you to our lovely panelists. We're first of all joined by Claire Nasir, meteorologist broadcaster, um, currently presenting on Channel 5, and also the author of several books, including What Does Rain Smell Like? With our second speaker, who's Simon King, a meteorologist and weather presenter for the BBC, both on Radio 5 Live and around the world. And then finally, we are joined by Dr. Rosie Oakes, who's a senior scientist at the Met Office. So a very distinguished and knowledgeable panel. I'm very glad that you can all join us this afternoon. It's an absolute delight to have you here. Um, so let's start off with, I think, the question that's most commonly in my mind, which is, we are obsessed with the weather in Britain. We do seem to be slightly more obsessed with it than perhaps other countries. Do you think that's true? Are we more obsessed with the weather than other nations? Claire, let's, let's go to you first and then we'll see what the others think to say. Thanks very much, Sophie. Well, I'm in good company here because I work both with Rosie and Simon. We both work in the world of weather and climate. So they are going to agree with me when it comes to the obsession that not only communities have around the UK with weather, but elsewhere as well. But let's talk about the British weather first of all. Um, I think the first thing you say when you meet someone for the first time, you talk about passing pleasantries to do with the weather because we're all experts when it comes to what's happening outside. And there's a good reason for that in the UK. Blink and the skies change. They morph from dark to light. They, they change from bright to grim, from dry to teeming with rain. And everybody wants to know what's happening outside because everybody steps out every day. And in the summer, temperatures can soar to the mid 30s Celsius. That's too hot for most. And in the winter, we can see temperatures dip down sub-zero, both uncomfortable extremes. 
So even though, yes, we're all expert in our own lunchtime about the weather, and so we should be, there are issues around that. And, you know, one of the big things about working in the Met Office is all about thriving and being safe. And certainly stepping outside when there's a lot of rain, um, driving in your car, there's so many risks associated with that. And weather can really disrupt your day or when the sun comes out, it can brighten your morning. In fact, research released earlier this year in January, it was a study which explored the effects of morning weather on people's mood and well-being. And it was published in an applied psychology journal. And the researchers found that the better the weather was in the morning, the more people felt energized and satisfied with their work. Contrary, when the weather was bad, people felt more fatigued and unsatisfied. But there's a question mark there. I, I read the report and I thought, what do they define as better? And I think I'm going to hand over to Simon there because obviously it's, it's all things to all people and they can be very different, can't they? Yeah, thanks, Claire. And uh, you're absolutely right, because um, better or worse weather is something we kind of steer away from when we're doing the weather forecast. Um, because, as you said, lots of people interpret the weather in very different ways. You know, so for um, many of us, you know, a dry, warm couple of weeks is good weather. But then for a farmer, that may be bad weather because that may, you know, that's not what they want. They want a bit of rain. So we kind of quite carefully in saying what's good, what's bad, what's better, what's worse in terms of the weather. But back to kind of the main question of why we, we are so obsessed with it. Um, I think it's because we're in Ireland and where we sit in the world means that we can have so many different types of weather. So if it's a northerly wind, then it can get really cold, get frosty. Um, if it's a southwesterly wind, which is our prevailing wind direction, then you can get lots of cloud, you can get rain, get wind. And then if you have an easterly wind direction, you know, again, the weather changes so many times. So we can get so many different types of weather and it can change on a daily, even hourly basis. I remember doing the Reading Half Marathon many years ago now, but we started the morning cold, frosty with blue skies. It was a beautiful start of the day. And then um, we had hail, we had snow. Then the sun came back out again. Then we had like temperatures rising. You know, we had all the weather in like the, the, the hour and a half, two hours that we were running, running the uh, half marathon. So I think that's why we're all, we're all obsessed with it because it can change so so often here in the UK. I'm really, I'm really kind of relieved to hear you say that actually because I do sometimes wonder actually if like so weather is so changeable here and sometimes I think I might be imagining it it's kind of relieving to sort of go no actually our weather really is that changeable um I live in Scotland and spend a lot of time outside and there have been days where we've just had as we say all four seasons in one yeah. day and that's uh I think that's one of the reasons why we're so obsessed with it in Scotland. But there's something else I think in, in what you said and what Claire said which is about the impact that the weather has on us and do you think that that has an impact on or rather does the impact have an impact if you'll pardon that um for countries that actually are so influenced by the weather that it has a real impact on how we live our lives that must also make us particularly aware of the weather as well do you think well, I'm going to ask Rosie about that because she lived in the US for a time and she was just telling me about an, an interesting anecdote about I think it was a hurricane or a tornado where she hid in the bath or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, Rosie, so I lived in the, about that. I, yeah, I lived in the US for 10 years and it was interesting being out there because like you say in the UK we talk about the weather all the time. But in some states in the US, the weather is less changeable. So, for example, when you visit friends in California, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's so sunny. They're like, yeah, it's been sunny since February. So it's always sunny. So they don't really talk about it as much. They just assume that it will be sunny every day. And the other big mistake I made is that I looked out the window and if it was sunny in the winter, I'd be like, oh, it's going to be such a nice day. But if it's a clear sky in the US in the winter, it can be so cold down to minus 20 or something so that was um really interesting and then what Claire was mentioning is I lived in Philadelphia and in the UK we we don't get tornadoes but I was asleep I get a text message warning at three in the morning saying warning there's tornadoes in your area and you need to uh, you know initiate your tornado plan and I was like oh no I don't have one so <laughs> quick google it said hide in your basement we were on a first floor flat so that wasn't an option or go in the bath but 
Um, yeah, so anyway, I hid in the bath for half an hour at three in the morning and I went into work the next day and some of my friends who had lived in Florida, which gets a lot more of these tornadoes coming through, they were like, you're in the middle of Philadelphia. You're surrounded by buildings. You, you're never going to get a tornado, make it that far into the city. <laughs> you didn't need to hide in the bath. But anyway, I did spend half an hour in the bath. So, yeah, I think uh, in the US, I think in some areas, yeah, they have this more consistent weather. So they talk about it less, but they do have these extremes and, and they, talk, they do talk about that more. And, and I'm much more trained to prepare for that. I do also. Um, sorry. I, I also do think that um, across the world, there are places where people live hand to mouth, millions of rural communities where the land is really fundamental uh, for their livelihoods and, and their lives. And I work for the United Nations for an agency called IFAD, which is the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And I've just done a virtual field trip to Nepal, um, virtual as in chatting like this. Obviously, there's reasons why we couldn't get out there. Um, and they've had the worst year. They really have some from the drought in April, which caused wildfires, which really ruins topsoil as well as kills wildlife and, and also farmlands and crops to too much rain during the monsoon season um, through June to now, actually, they're still seeing flooding now. And in July, there were some devastating landslides associated with this flooding. And again, not only does that ruin farmland, but people's, people lose their lives, and they did. So they've had a succession of really extreme weather events, which has meant there's been no food for, for, for thousands of people. And this food is really, really key, not only to go to market, but for their families. And the other key thing is obviously that, that you know, their soil is ruined for another season. So they have to go back to basics. So whether, you know, for the UK, it is about insurance. It is about when there's flooding, it's about people's livelihoods because businesses can be ruined, homes can't be lived in for many, many months. But I think there's, it's a very, very different level when we're talking about uh, rural communities who live, live by the land. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's one of the things that um, is very much in my mind as we have these kind of conversations, particularly around COP, is that I think we're most of the time quite lucky in the UK and that we often don't see such extreme weather. But obviously those kind of events are becoming more common. And like you say, it has enormous impacts on so many communities. It, it's not just about, you know, we talk about the weather, it's it is that, you know, the, the pleasantries of everyday life, but there are points where it kind of tips us over in terms of that extreme weather into, um, it's, it can be a matter of life and death. Um, so before we talk a little bit more about climate change, which again, I have a lot of questions about, um, obviously I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you actually forecast the weather because my weather forecasting skills are very much stepping out of my front door in the morning and seeing what Edinburgh holds for me and as Simon's already mentioned that's not very reliable um, <laughs> I would love to know how the pros do it so can you start off by just giving us a Simon can we come to you on this first and just tell yeah, us yeah sure the, in so, terms, how does this work so uh, it it starts with similar to what you're saying you know looking outside and knowing what the weather is doing at that moment in time. So that's why we have um, weather observing sites. We have weather stations across the UK, but across the globe as well. And they are collecting data all the time. And all that data, you know, we're talking about millions of bits of weather information from ships, from satellites, from MET stations. And it all comes into um, the Met Office. They've got a big supercomputer, but the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, they have a big supercomputer. So, you know, different, different centres do different forecasts. Mm. So you've got millions of bits of data coming into these uh, computers every hour. And then it's the job of the supercomputer to basically churn it all up. And the way it does it, it kind of cover, you know, around the globe, it breaks up into little boxes, squares. Um, right through the atmosphere and you know uh, on on this on the surface of the earth and from for every one of those boxes it will try and work out what the weather is doing at that point and then in relation to the other boxes and then it will kind of work out the maths and physics uh, and actually the, the supercomputers can do 14 quadrillion calculations a second which is just a mind-boggling number it's uh, I think it's four it's a 14 with 16 zeros behind it um 
So every single second it's doing these calculations. So it's very, very complex. And you, what you've got to think about the atmosphere is it's a fluid. So it's always changing. That's why it's so difficult to forecast the weather as well, because you can have, you know, small changes in the weather in one location and that will have an impact on what the weather's doing in another location. So the supercomputer kind of produces the weather forecast. And then it's our job as the, the meteorologist, the forecaster to basically interpret that data. Now, when I started in weather 20, 20 years ago or so now, um, you know, the, the supercomputers were not as good as they are now. So the job of the meteorologist was a lot more interpreting the data and, you know, using all that to kind of put a forecast together for a single location or UK. But now the computers are getting much better at that and the forecast is becoming much better. But you still, you know, you know the strengths and the weaknesses of these, these supercomputers. So you still need that human interaction to basically say, well, you know, hasn't got the rain quite right for that location. We need to adjust it here and there. And, you know, I do that on a daily basis. So even though the actual weather forecast is kind of largely done for me, my job is to basically interpret that and to, to, to um, make it into a kind of usable product, I guess, when we're talking on the radio about, you know, is it going to rain today or not? Is it going to snow today? Uh, so it's quite a complex thing. And I think, you know, Someone's always, people ask me, you know, will, will computers completely take over from the weather forecast? And, um, you know, we are kind of seeing that, but to, to get a forecast for every postcode in the UK, you know, to get that 100% accurate, you know, it's just not going to happen. So we will always need, I think, a human to kind of interpret it. And that's one thing as well I would say about, you know, if you're using apps or websites and just purely going on that, then the forecast can be wrong because it's just directly from the computer and it doesn't get it right all the time. That is very interesting. I think both to see the kind of the complexity of it, but also the importance of actually being able to interpret that, put it in context that actually you only often get either if you're, you know, you're a human being who can look at that data or maybe if you're in the, the area. I suppose one of the things that I'm thinking about at the moment is, again, going back to climate change, as, as we will be for years to come, I'm sure, does this make it, does, is the changing climate going to make it harder for you to forecast the weather? Because if are things changing, are weather patterns changing that make it harder for you to interpret that? I'll ask Claire in a, in a sec, but I'll just give you this little um, uh, thing that I remember from the forecasting college uh, when I started the Met Office. So when you forecast temperatures, for example, uh, you would you would very very rarely forecast a record or an extreme temperature because it, you know this is 20 years ago again you know it was, it was quite unlikely for that to happen but I think what we're seeing with climate change is the weather becoming more extreme and uh, what is incredible I think is that when we have a heat wave in the Pacific Northwest in Canada I don't know if you remember the news in Lytton in Canada um, that temperature record was broken not by 0 0.1 0 0.2 degrees celsius which is what you would expect maybe temperatures to be broken you know breaking records by it was broken by four degrees celsius which is incredible i mean that is for scientists climate scientists that is a lot mm -hmm. that it's been broken by so you would have, you would never have forecasted that so, you, you know, that, that is part of the problem. Forecasting these extremes is, it is quite tricky. Yeah. Claire, did you want to come in? Yes. I mean, I, um, Rosie understands much more about the climate models. And I think the key thing that when we're experiencing now as meteorologists is there's a real blending between the climate forecasts and the, the weather forecasts. Even just five, six years ago, if there was an extreme weather event, it was very difficult to communicate whether that had anything to do with climate change but because of techniques and and a lot more computing power but also something called attribution studies which I'll, I'll ask Rosie to explain in a moment um, certainly now we can really relate one thing to another so um, weather comes within the the scope of climate as we know so let's cast your mind back to the 3rd of October last year we actually had the wettest day 
ever on record across the UK, where on an even one grid point, north, south, east and west, we had 47 millimetres of rain. So much rain fell in that day, it would have filled the whole of Loch Lomond, no, Loch, Loch Ness which is the largest lake in the UK. So absolutely huge amount. But because of what we now called attribution studies, we were able to explain that in the past, an event like that, where we saw copious amounts of rain, more rain than we've ever seen during records began, it's a one in 300 year event in the past. Currently it's about a one in 100 year event, but because of climate change, we're likely to see that every 30 years. And so really climate scientists are able to analyze these events in a really incredible way so we can communicate this information to the general public so people are aware that these things are happening and we're on the forefront of climate change it's not just the small islands it's not just local communities say in Africa where the temperature global temperatures risen more so than other parts of the world but actually here in the UK we're witnessing very different weather because of climate change and attribution studies is a, is a really key tool that we use now Rosie. Yeah, I think uh, what Claire and Simon have really highlighted is that climate change is already happening. You know, I feel like when we learn about climate change when I was in school, we were always like, oh, in the future, the climate will change. But I think just the, those two examples that Simon and Claire highlighted with the heat waves and the really high rainfall levels, that is our climate changing. So Claire mentioned that we do attribution studies. So this is one of the things that has been developed by Met Office scientists. But they essentially take the global climate model, which has all the equations about how clouds form and how rain forms, and they run it both in current conditions, so with the CO2 levels that we're currently at, but they also run it at levels of CO2 if there hadn't been human emissions of carbon dioxide. And they run those models side by side and then they can see what the different um, distributions of rainfall or temperatures look like at the other end. So then they can do a direct comparison between like what we're living in, the world we're living in now and the world we could have been living in if humans hadn't added carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And the difference between them, by looking at the difference between those two models, you can kind of uh, attribute, that's what's called attribution. You can say like, okay, well, you know, human activities have caused this much extra warming and therefore have made this event much more likely. So I think it's, it's a really interesting way to tie human activities to the changes that we're seeing in our weather because of climate change. And if, I'll just quickly say as well, I mean, Claire very briefly mentioned it, but again, I remember when I first started broadcasting and the, the, the question that comes up all the time from news journalists is when you've got like a, a flooding event, the, the question they'd always ask is, is this because of climate change? And, you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago, really, you, you, the answer would be, well, we can't say that this one event was climate change. You know, we weren't, just weren't allowed to say that. But now there has definitely been a shift in the communication of it where you can say, well, okay, you know, last week somewhere flooded, you can say, well, that one event may not have been caused directly by climate change, but the chances of that of being flooded has been made greater because of climate change. So the dice has been loaded uh, for these events to happen. So you can definitely, the communication of it now is, um, which I think is becoming more people's minds now, is that if you've got a heat wave or a flood event or whatever, um, you know, we are definitely more able to say that, you know, this is, this is more likely to happen because of climate change. Yeah, and I think some of that comes back to the computing power as well. These attribution studies used to take a lot longer, maybe a year. So I could say, oh, Simon, remember that heat wave in 2015? By the way, it was 100 times more likely because of climate change. And you'd be like, but now it's 2017. What are you talking about? So I think there has been some progression in the methodology. So now they can run these attribution studies much quicker, often like a week or two after the event. So you can get those numbers to the people who are communicating to the public and so th these can come up in conversations rather than uh, the initial scientific studies which were done more on their uh, research timelines. <laughs> this feels incredibly important and it's it's making me reflect as well about the way that how we communicate climate change and climate events has kind of changed within my lifetime so I remember um, even in say the this is where you decide where you want to talk about years or how old you were and whether you want to train. <laughs> Let's go for in the kind of early 2000s. Um, I think a lot of us were still 
you know, having conversations with a lot of people, a lot of other people who didn't necessarily believe that climate change was a real and present threat. And then, you know, 10 years, five, 10 years later, we're talking about people saying, oh, okay, well, climate change is obviously a thing, but is this climate change? Is that, oh, can we see this now? Whereas now it's 2021 and we're able to demonstrate through the models that you've just talked about that not only is climate change real, not only is it happening, but it's happening now and the effects can be seen now, which I think is incredibly important, actually. Um, there's something I, I think I'd like to kind of tease out a little bit, which is, um, there are countries which obviously have much more are much more exposed to climate change and the, the kind of the change of climate in general than than we are. Um, so I've, I've always been very aware, for example, like South Asia, Southeast Asia is very vulnerable, but also a lot of the countries that we see, for example, are not the countries that when we talk about, for example, extreme weather events are not the countries I expected to see being affected by that. You know, we're seeing very high temperatures in Western Europe, for example, you know, the last summer and summer before that were very, very hot in Western Europe. America is um, bewildering to me, the, the kind of extreme weather that they're experiencing there. Um, so I suppose I'd, I'd love to know from you, you know, are there things that make those countries more vulnerable in particular, are they particularly vulnerable to climate change? But also, what does that mean for the UK? Because obviously, we are we are famously a temperate nation in terms of weather. Um, you know, our weather tends to be very mild and in the middle of the road. So, I, I there are lots of things I want to unpack with you all, um, and I'm not sure where to go first. <laughs> if I can start, um, um, Rosie and I did a really interesting program recently, a uh, podcast on our mostly climate podcast series about climate tipping points. Um, and how they're so interactive, first of all, and how we're learning so much about them. But if you cast your mind back just to last year and the, the Arctic heat wave, which hit an all time record of 38 degrees Celsius, actually on my birthday, the 20th of June, and the amount of wildfires associated with that, it was unprecedented. But just not only that, we interviewed a really interesting climate scientist from uh, Scandinavia who had looked at rapid and abrupt thawing of permafrost and how this information now is being fed into new climate models. So we have a much better model or a grasp of what's going on and how these parts are of the world, which perhaps we have not ignored, but certainly we've been focusing on other areas of the world, are now really feeding into these climate models to, to give much better results. And certainly when it comes to climate tipping points, permafrost is one of those which we are really concerned about because it's not just the thawing of um, frozen, permanently frozen ground in the in the Arctic Circle, but it releases a huge amount of gases, greenhouse gases, and the, the whole ecosystem in the area just goes awry. And I'm going to hand over to Rosie now, who knows much more about that. And the, the program we did was really fascinating because we looked at oceans as well as rainforests and sea ice. It, you know, it, it goes on. Yes. I'm going to um, try and get back to, so you, you mentioned, Sophie, that people around the world are impacted by climate change. So my job at the Met Office is actually internationally. So I work internationally with countries and communities to understand how they're being impacted by climate change and what information we can provide to them to help them make better decisions. And that risk to climate change, it's really made up of three things. So it's the hazard itself. So that could be the extreme rainfall we've talked about or the extreme heat that we've mentioned today. But it's also your exposure to that hazard. So if there's going to be more rain, like do you live on a floodplain? And this might be changing, like you say, even in developed nations, maybe areas which previously weren't susceptible to flooding are now because of increased rain. So it's the hazard, the exposure, and then the third bit is the vulnerability. And that's almost like, how able are you to get out of the way? So if you get a text being like, flood warning, you need to move. Can you go and stay with a friend? Do you have the resources to move you and your family? If your crop fails as a farmer, can you still feed your family? And I think we really see the impacts, therefore, of climate change much more in lower um, economically developed countries. So I've been doing a lot of reading recently about Africa. And if they experience a drought, their crops fail and they have to pull their kids out of school. Whereas if farmers in the UK experienced a drought, yes, they lose their crop, but there is a support system here that their kids would still be able to go to school. And so they're less vulnerable. So it, it really is this complex interaction of both the climate science, which that's how I've come up and studied it. But there's a lot of real human aspects to climate change as well. 
Simon, do you want to weigh in on that as well? Well, I mean, you've, you've both covered some really good points. And I, the only thing I would say is, um, you know, with, with climate change, we've talked a lot about mitigation, obviously trying to stay to this 1.5 degrees Celsius and how we need to cut our emissions. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, going net zero and all that stuff. But as Rosie uh, mentioned earlier, you know, we are seeing the climate changing now. Um, so what's interesting with COP this, this year has been as well about adaptation. And there's definitely more conversation now about adaptation. So we know that the climate is changing. So we need to adapt to it uh, because, you know, it's clear that you know, it depends on who you talk to, that when we're going to exceed that 1.5 degrees Celsius and that's going to have massive consequences around the world. So what can we do to adapt to that change? And um, this week, actually, I went back to uh, Fish Lake in South Yorkshire and I did, did a piece for uh, BBC News there talking to the residents about what happened at Fish Lake and uh, the flooding that they experienced. And it was really interesting, actually, there was a chap there who basically said that he never wants to go through that again and he's moving out of fish lake now this is quite extreme but he is therefore a climate refugee you know it, he is impacted directly from climate change and he's moving away from the area and then we're going to see that on a, a huge scale in some parts of the world you know which will become um un, 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 unlivable you know so then we'll have to move to other places so we've got to adapt We've got to adapt to climate change, um, you know, whether that's in the UK by building more flood defences or, you know, having a flood plan, you know, as simple as that. You know, if you're in a flood risk area, what are you going to do if you're at risk of flooding? Uh, and we all, you know, everyone has to make those uh, decisions and uh, choices. And I think um, with flooding in the UK, that's one thing which we're, is of great concern because of protecting against those sort of one in a hundred year events which seem to be occurring much more often. Um, so I'll give you some numbers just from the last um, year. November 2019 to March 2020, it's estimated that due to flooding it cost our economy in the UK £333 million. Pounds. However, without the flood defences, that bill would have been an extra £2.1 billion. Pounds. So you can see where we've come from and how much we've really adapted so far to protecting, but it's not enough. And the other key thing, which Simon was talking about with adaptation, is it sometimes it does take a long time for these, these the engineers to come in and create something which is safe. I'll give you an example of that. The flooding of 1953, which affected the East Anglia as well as the, the Southeast, where hundreds of people died, thousands actually in the Low Countries. That flood, flood prompted the Thames Barrier. Now that um, Thames, the Thames Barrier was planned in the 1960s. It was then built in the 1970s and it was opened in 1983, 30 years later, 30 years when this whole region of the UK, which is prone to flooding, was really, really vulnerable to one of those one in a hundred year floods. So it takes a long time to turn around adaptation plans. And across the world, what we're seeing is that for every US, one US dollar or one pound paid out for mitigation, only a, a matter of pence is paid out for for adaptation and it's not the poorest countries that are, are receiving that money climate funds are going to sort of emerging uh, economies rather than the poorest countries and i'll give you an example lake chad is depleted in terms of water volume by 90 percent in the last five or six decades and it services 30 million people around that region and so when drought happens you know the half of the population of the uk are starving equivalent but then when the rains come they rain the rains come intensely and heavily um, and they've got there's nowhere to hide because flooding occurs because the soil is so poor and people haven't been able to adapt to the being on the front line of climate change and that is the that the scope and the scale what we're seeing around the world well i think you've I, all of you have really kind of very kind of clearly and um very effectively articulated actually just the scale of the issues that that we're facing and I'm very grateful to to you as well for kind of drawing out the ways in which um 
there are people in other parts of the world that are far more vulnerable to these effects than we are. And actually, um, it's um, it struck me as being not totally dissimilar to the way in which the world has faced COVID. You know, climate change is going to affect many, you know, basically every part of the world, but there will be people who are far more vulnerable to that, not because of where they are necessarily, but because of the resources that they have to kind of face that issue. Um, so I'm really glad that we got to, to draw that out. That feels like a really important point. Rosie, I want to come back to you because I know that so much of your work is about working with communities to address the impact and, and to try and find solutions. We've talked a little bit about the impact of flooding, which obviously we're a coastal nation and flooding as sea levels rise is, is going to be an issue for us in the UK. Are there other impacts that you think we're likely to see in the UK? Are there other ways that you think the weather might change? What should we expect if we can't put a stop or at least reduce the levels of climate change that we're going to see? Yeah, so thinking about the UK specifically, the Met Office were involved in running a set of projections at quite a high resolution, actually, just for the UK to help people prepare for the future climate conditions. And as we've mentioned, we're projecting that there will be increased rainfall and increased extreme events. So the overall message was that we're likely to see milder, wetter winters, but also hotter, drier summers. Uh, and I think Maybe the optimist in you is thinking, yes, hot or drier summers, I'll get to go to the beach without being rained on, it would be great. But actually, if we take a step back and think about what does that mean, hot or drier summers, this comes back to what Simon was saying at the beginning of the uh, panel about, for a farmer, that's not good. One if you're growing crops that rely on the rain, then they, they may fail. Um, there's meant to be, uh, we've seen that there's increased impacts on people's health, especially of elderly and vulnerable people under when the temperatures are much higher. And the extreme temperatures from those projections are estimated to be up to 10 degrees higher in some areas. So it's, it's these extremes that Simon was mentioning that we maybe wouldn't have thought of forecasting before. So there are really a lot of impacts that we'll see in the UK, even though, like you say, maybe when you think about climate change initially, you think about oh, that happens far away. You know, we don't live on an island in the middle of the Pacific. It won't impact us, but it really will. It already is, and it will continue to impact all of us. Wow, I, 10 degrees is extraordinary. <laughs> so I think we often, because we're talking about, for example, um, the targets that are hoping to be set at COP are about limited global climate change to 1.5 degrees, but I suppose that's an average globally over time, right? So in practice, that could still mean that we have days that are maybe 10 degrees hotter, which is extraordinary to think about. Yeah, absolutely. So the numbers that you're hearing from COP, that is an average temperature. And already, I mean, we've already seen at least one degree C average global warming, but that is an average. And in the polar regions, it's been up to three times that. Oh, I'm now being blinded by the sun. There we go. You said the weather <laughs> affects us. I'm now like a ghost person. Um, so it, it, is, um, it is different globally. And like I said, I've been doing some work in Africa recently, and um, they're projected to see increased warming relative to global average moving forward as well. So there is um, that variability. And then there's the variability day to day and season to season around the average, which probably Simon and Clara are a better positioned to talk about than me. Well, we're, what I'd like to do is to, obviously, these are the biggest questions I think most of us are going to be grappling with for a, a very long time. This is something that's going to affect all of us globally. Um, and, and I think it's very easy to feel, I think, very scared and very overwhelmed because the, the impact could be so enormous and the, a lot of us feel quite helpless in these kind of situations. Um, so I want to kind of bring this part to a close before we go on to questions by saying, obviously, you know, there are, there are some things that we can still do. Um, obviously, that's, that's what we're all hoping for at COP, I think, is for some kind of commitment to really uh, deal with the worst aspects of this and really try and reduce it. And for the people who are joining us today, um, you know, many of whom are very involved in their communities uh, and in their local areas, what sort of things do you think are important that changes that people can make in their own lives or things that people can do as a community? Um, what sort of things do you think are, can help at that local level? Simon, can I come to you first? Um, yeah, so um, I think there's been a lot of discussion, um, you know, obviously we need to bring our carbon down to 
net zero. So, you know, the bigger things that I'm thinking about, you know, electric cars, electric vehicles, I know there's logistically a lot to be done still about charging points across the UK and outside people's houses. Um, but going electric, that's the kind of uh, big thing for transport. Um, the way we heat our homes, um, you've probably heard about the government's, um, you know, pathway to um, using um, um, heat storage uh, pumps, um, which again, you know, it seems like a long way off at the moment, but, you know, it's kind of the idea that we've got to change the way we heat our homes, but the here and now, you know, just changing, just putting your thermostat down a little bit more, all very minor changes in your home, but then obviously if everybody does that, then that's going to have a big um, impact on how much energy we're using day to day. Um, the whole meat issue, um, I, I love meat, I will still eat meat, but then I have definitely reduced the amount of eat, the meat that I, I'm eating. Um, you know, so again, just those very minor changes, but if we can all do that collectively, it will, it, it will make a big difference. Brilliant, thank you. Claire? Um, I want to just add to what Simon said about meat, because I think eating less meat is really fundamental to where we're going. And in fact, there's been so much innovation um, looking into meatless meats and plant based meats that actually the, the the whole sector seems to be disrupting right now, which means it's going to be quite cheap eventually to be sourcing those products on a supermarket shelf and doing your bit for the, the climate, because uh, cows in themselves use so much land they use so eat so many calories to produce just one calorie equivalent of food just for us and the echo the environmental footprint is absolutely massive and as the world population grows to what's suggested to is going to be around nine to ten billion by around 2050 we're going to need 60 percent more agricultural land so the business as usual model is, is not going to work so that's one key thing that i think is going to be very interesting to see how trends go and how consumers respond to that and the other one obviously is the electric car which even 10 years ago, I don't think we would, could have really predicted that it would have just, you know, pushed into the market with such gusto, so much so the UK government has now pledged that it's phasing out fuel based cars, which is, um, which is absolutely incredible and something which obviously I'm going to be watching with real interest because how many cars are on the on the roads of the UK right now and how many uh, points are we going to have just to even just to recharge them so the infrastructure around that is going to be massive so it's good to get an EV car now and there's so many subsidies out there it's a great step in the right direction but yes it'd be interesting to see how we it pans out relative to how we can cope particularly with the grid etc so there's two things and the other thing is just stepping outside and talking to people and and talking to your local mp and we've just done a festival of nature here in wilmslow where we had a brilliant music event and it was all pedal powered mm -hmm. and it's just doing things like that where we're all getting our hands dirty just to make sure and just to illustrate the point that actually being green is fun it's cost effective and it's good for our health that is brilliant i love the idea of a pedal powered concert that's incredibly a cr incredibly kind of creative fun solution actually which um I don't know about you but I'm certainly trying to kind of look and hold on to those kind of things when it all gets a bit overwhelming so I'm mentally filing that away to suggest to a community group and Rosie let's let's finish with you before we go to the questions what would your thoughts be? Yeah I think Simon and Claire have made some really good points and I think like you say the space is changing really fast at the moment so Claire mentioned electric vehicles. I actually didn't buy a car once I moved back from the States to Exeter and I'm part of a car club. So I do have access to an electric car, but I probably drive it once a month. So it means there's actually a group of us in the community and between us, there are maybe 10 cars in Exeter. So it's just actually, we can use technology. We can just book it on an app when we need it. They charge us per mile. If you use the electric cars, you actually don't get charged per mile. But that's pretty cool. Wow. Um, and it's a really great way. Actually, maybe everyone doesn't need their own car. Maybe you can share with a neighbor. And that just means actually the resources going into making a car, you know, that, that also takes power and mining and all of those things. So um, I'm trying to think of kind of new ways to get around this. So yeah, I get around extra cycling and taking the bus and it's been working really well. And I think 
There are some win-wins like Claire mentioned. So when I cycle to work, I actually, I think I do better work. Maybe I should get paid more on the days I cycle in. I'm <laughs> definitely awake by the time I get there, especially if there's a bit of a drizzle on the way in, wake you up. Um, and it's funny when you cycle past other cyclists, they're saying hello, you can talk to uh, people walking on the street on the way. So it really builds community. And you're obviously lowering your carbon footprint and decreasing air pollution. So there are definitely ways that we can get involved and make a difference at home. And, and I would suggest taking those small actions, at least for me, I find climate change an overwhelming topic and I think about it every day. But taking those actions about how you travel, how you heat your home, what you're eating, what you're deciding to buy, we are big consumers. So just think about what, where are your clothes made? How are they made? Do you really need 20 jumpers or is 10 fine? Or maybe even five, you know? So I think just being conscious of what we're doing and, and thinking about the climate and keep talking about it, that's really, really important. Thank you, Rosie. I think those are, are, are really excellent reflections. I think at times when um, the problem seems scary and overwhelming, it's really important to focus on the things that we can do. And sometimes those are um, things that feel really small in the face of something huge, but actually if that's what we can control and uh, with enough of us making that kind of action, it makes a difference together. Maybe those are the things that we, we can focus on. Um, we have a lot of really good questions and they tend to fall into one of either the, the climate change camp or the weather forecasting camp. So we'll have a nice mix as we go through. Um, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start with um, uh, a climate change question. Um, actually, perhaps this is a mix of both. Um, we have a question from Mike about the accuracy of floodplain mapping tools. Um, I think we've seen quite a rise in this as we've started to become more aware of how um, flooding will affect us all locally as we've seen a rise of kind of um, mapping tools where you can see um, projected um, flood risk basically for a specific area which I know has been uh, particularly worrying for some of my family when they see actually just how high their risk of flooding is likely to get over the next 20-30 years um, but how accurate would you say those are? Um, are there any ones in particular that um, you would say are particularly accurate? Um, are these something that Mike particularly asks um, is this something that local authorities should really be looking at? Um, when we're, for example, planning new houses. Can I, can I, if I can start, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a hydrologist. I'm not an expert in uh, flooding. Or that I did before I worked as a weather forecaster. Actually, I was a, a flood flood forecaster. Um, but obviously, it's, it's moved on a lot more since then. But you're absolutely right about the, where we build our homes. Um, you know, we have seen far too often houses being built on floodplains and you know <laughs> they are going to flood that is just the nature of that's what that's what's naturally going to happen so we definitely need to be more careful about where we we're building our homes um but interestingly i spoke to the environment agency this week as i said when i was in fish lake and even though we've got millions of pounds worth um of in investment into flood defenses um they said that you know they're not going to be able to prevent every single flooding event. That that is unfortunately the nature that we got, we're, we're faced with. We, we're not we're not going to be able to protect absolutely everywhere. Um, so we all have to adapt to that, and we all have to make sure that we are, um, we, you know, if we know that we're in a flood risk area. And as you said, I don't know much about these maps, but certainly you know the mapping has become much better. That if you can get a hold of that, if you know that you live in a flood risk area, then you can make preparations for it um so yeah i mean that's that's one thing i'd say and it, it, the other problem i guess as well is that if you defend one area that can change the flow of the river and uh some residents in fish lake were telling me that um there was a lot of defenses going in on, in sheffield and it actually made the river flow faster through sheffield and therefore it's changed the way that the river behaves and it, that will impact the communities further down the river. So, and I, we know that in coastal areas as well, that if you put coastal defences in one part of the coast, it will have an impact down, down coast. So there's a lot to think about there. I mean, like the government, I wouldn't like to be in the government's shoes, you know, where do we protect what, what's, you know, where do most people live? Or, you know, we know that we're going to protect this area, but that's going to have an impact on an area down there. We can't protect everyone. I think that's probably the key. Uh, so we certainly need to think about where we are building uh, houses. Thanks, Simon. Um, 
I have a question which I think I'm going to bring to you, Rosie, because I think this touches nicely on something you said earlier. Um, what would your response be to people who say the climate has always changed? Oh, well, that is a good question for me because I'm actually a geologist by training. So um, love rocks, still love rocks. <laughs> but I just study the climate now. Um, so my uh, master's thesis was on uh, what was going on in the oceans 130 million years ago. And at that point, the carbon dioxide levels are predicted to have been five times higher than they are today. And that's linked to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, we were much closer to America back then, would have been cheaper flights. But as that mid-ocean ridge opened up, the volcanoes let out carbon dioxide and other gases, and that caused um, warming at that time. I think the really interesting thing that we've learned from looking at the fossil record, and we can look at how, what the temperature was like in the past by looking at things like tiny pieces of plankton that build their shells from the ocean water. We can analyze the chemistry of those and work out what the climate was like in the past. We have never seen a warming as quick as we're seeing today. So the fastest warming event that we've seen in the fossil record was 56 million years ago, called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. Geologists love it, honestly. And in the rock record, this looks like a really, really rapid warming. But predictions are that the warming we're seeing today is 10 times faster than that. So it is just uh, like nothing we've ever seen before. So yes, the climate has changed in the past, but it's never changed at this rate. So that's kind of always what I get back to when people ask that question. Um, but it is is it can be frustrating and I feel help, it's helpful for me when I have some numbers on my side when I'm talking to people about past climate change because otherwise it's just like yes it has no it hasn't so um that's what I would recommend have some numbers in your back pocket for when people ask you about that. Thank you Rosie that, that is a great answer and I have to say I I really like the perspective of um, normally we, when we uh, ask this question there will be a graph that illustrates climate change over the last hundred years um, which is very much a kind of people-sized um, time scale. And I love the idea of bringing in geologists who can go, well, actually, over the last 14 million years, I do have to tell you that this is still the largest, <laughs> quickest increase in, in heating ever. So uh, rather blows a smaller chart out the water. Um, that's great advice, thank you. And I think the last question we have time for um, is a weather one. So I'm gonna point this to Claire and Simon. Do you have a suggested weather forecasting app? People would love to know what you would recommend. What is the most reliable? I suspect you're contractually obliged to say that it's the Met Office app, but I would love to hear. I'm going to say the Met Office app because it, I think it is the best app. Um, the reason why is what I refer to what Simon was talking about earlier. Um, so we do have um, the hour by hour, depending on where you live. So you can put in your postcode and, you know, it will give you um, a weather forecast for that area. But also we have an Envision part to the app, which is the R meteorologist interpretation of that data. So we sort of add value um, on, on just an extra level. So it, so the temperatures might be slightly different to what you see on the app. And we sort of talk about different sort of regional differences. So, for example, where there'll be sea breezes on a nice sunny day, which would, could reduce the temperature by five degrees um, or where there could be localized fog. So things like that. Um, I think just adding that sort of human element just brings up the level of the forecast. Although I think the apps are really good and they're great for planning. And most of the apps now have rainfall radar where you can see where the showers are coming and you can have, you know, the, the animate, they animate to see what's going to happen in the next five or 10 hours. And they are great, particularly if you're stepping outside. And I mean, this evening we're having um, a bit of an outdoor party here. It's my daughter's birthday. Um, and, you know, we're going to dodge the showers and that's not down to me. It's down to the app. So I'm off. Yeah. Uh, yes. I've got a day off today, so I won't be giving out any forecast. Simon. <laughs> can I, can I, um, so with apps, what I would say is you need to know how to, to, to interpret them, I think is a real key. And, um, you know, I get this a lot that if an app has got a shower on it every single hour of the day, it doesn't mean that it's going to rain all day. <laughs> and so it means that in that one hour, there is a chance of of rain, of, of a shower. And again, let's, you know, 
showers are incredibly difficult to forecast you know exact locations for you know it could be raining in your town but then a mile down the road it may be completely dry but the app will have a shower for both of those locations because it can't say exactly in three hours time where that shower is going to be so yeah i would have some caution of, of how you read these apps and there is a difference between showers and rainfall so if it's just like a a cloud or a dark cloud with rain uh, that's different to a shower so you know <laughs> it's like you, you've got to be careful on how you read these apps and what i'd also say is um there are you know the met office app the bbc weather app they're very good apps um you know some of the other apps that you can get you know maybe a little bit more dodgy and if you want to find out what the weather is going to be like in uh two months time for a wedding that you might have do not go to one of those websites that will tell you what the weather's going to do in two months time to the precise hour that it's going to be sunny and it's going to be like 24 degrees or something because it will change it will absolutely change you know we can't forecast that far in advance um so you know again some caution you know when you're looking like five to seven days ahead on apps you know it will change i guarantee it will change uh, in the days leading up to that point that is a, a very useful caveat thank you simon <laughs> i'm afraid that is that is all we have time for so first of all i just want to thank our phenomenal speakers Claire Nassir, Simon King and Rosie Oaks. It's been uh, a real pleasure to, to benefit from your knowledge and insight. And thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you so much to all our lovely guests. We really appreciate you joining us as well. And I hope that you have been as inspired as I have. I feel like I've got to indulge my, my passion and obsession for the weather, but also feeling actually much more informed about the reality of climate change and, and what I can do. And I hope you are as well. So if you do have time to tell us about what you thought the session, my colleague Katie has just um, popped a link in the chat. Please do take two minutes to tell us what you think. Um, we take it all very seriously and it helps us decide um, what we do in the future. So please do tell us. Um, and we do have another couple of hours of things going on. We kicked off on Thursday afternoon with the Festival of Discovery and we are going strong until this evening. Um, I'm going to be doing um, a stream yard on our Facebook page in an hour with a fantastic climate activist uh, uh, called Zoe Skipper-Reed. So I recommend personally that you join me again there. Um, but there is a whole program of things that you can check out um, on the festivaldiscovery.com. I would also say that we have recorded the session so that we can share it and we will be putting it up on the website afterwards. So please do share this with your friends. If you do have friends um, who are telling you that uh, the Earth's climate has always changed and you want a handy geologist to pull out of your pocket and prove them wrong, um, then we have got just the thing for you. So you'll be able to share that recording with them afterwards. But for now, I'm just going to say thank you again all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, Really hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. And thank you again to our brilliant speakers.